everyone. Welcome to the Steve Maxwell Drums Podcast. Don't forget to check us out on our website at www.maxwelldrums.com and then our reverb stores at Steve Maxwell Drums-Chicago and Steve Maxwell Drums-New York. We also have social media, uh, two Instagram accounts, at Maxwell Drum Shop Chicagoland and then at Maxwell Drum Shop. And then also on Facebook, Steve Maxwell and Steve Maxwell Drum Shop. And then, of course, check us out on Twitter at Maxwell Drum Shop. We will interview players, collectors, drum and cymbal builders, and also teachers about all things percussion. And you can go to YouTube if you want to see the video. We'll have pictures of drum shops, of drum sets, badges, cymbals, all kinds of fun stuff. So let's get started. We hope you enjoy it. Three, two, one. Hey, again, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm doing good, and it's been a while since we've done a podcast here. It's been too long. Yeah, we've been really busy here at the shop. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> so we've thankfully, time. <laughs> thankfully, as we uh, all roll through uh, COVID and the related uh, craziness of that. We're getting there. We're coming, starting to see light at the end of the tunnel, so that's good. Right, yeah, lots of, lots of stuff moving around, vintage stuff, new stuff. Yeah, we've been busy, which is, which is good. Tons Glad of con- to see. consignment, which we're going to yeah. be talking about on some videos, but... Uh, today we're doing Slingerland. Yes, yeah, and uh, you know we've we've done little segments on each of the companies, and uh, we wanted to do Slingerland kind of just uh, not so much talking about the products and things like that, but just talking more about the uh, the era and the significant events and and the like that occurred during that era. Not so much talking about shell compositions or when they changed it from one lug style to another, but just talking on a more broad overview basis. Yeah, but before we start. Uh, the when was like the first time that you um, like kind of heard of Slingerland because you were you grew up in Rhode Island so was that was Slingerland big out there in Chicago it probably was oh but. yeah yeah I mean you know uh, we'll this point will come up uh, as we whirl through it but if you think of it there was um, a huge competition between Ludwig and Slingerland yeah. and well I'll, I'll, I'll easily roll into it here Slingerland basically started in the early 1900s it was Slingerland banjo and drum company you know I mean they made banjos too um, and and it evolved from there and in the 20s Ludwig and Slingerland were the major competitors in the Chicagoland area and you could argue in most of the major cities around the country. They were the major brands. Gretsch was, of course, a major brand, but not not really back at that period of time. Uh, Gretsch was a major brand for drum set playing starting around the 50s, well, 40s, you could say. But, you know, back in the 20s, it was really Ludwig, Slingerland, and also Leedy. But Ludwig and Slingerland were the big ones. They were, like, and, kind of taken over from Leedy was, like, huge in the... 20s and 30s and then yeah like they they go Leedy goes so far back that they were making stuff for like silent films and stuff like that. yeah 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 but then I when I think Slingerland I think kind of like the jazz age that's really yeah. what it makes me think of so what your to answer your question that competition between Ludwig and Slingerland lasted through the 70s which is really around when both of those companies started to uh, a trail off from their former glory let's put it that way Um, So when I would go into a music store when I was first studying, when I was 12. This would be on the East Coast. I was on the East Coast. But the same was true everywhere, where if you went into a music store, if they sold Slingerland, they were not allowed to sell Ludwig. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah, the, the, the dealerships, the territories were, in a sense, protected. So if you were the Ludwig dealer, that was your... You, ha- you were the guy. If you were in Chicago and you sold Ludwig, you were the guy that sold Ludwig in Chicago, but you couldn't sell Slingerland. Somebody else could sell Slingerland, but you couldn't sell Ludwig. That They couldn't sell Ludwig. So were, like, the really major stores exempt from that? Or d- did that, like, go away later? There weren't on? any major what about stores. Like, what about, like, Frank's? Like that? Well, no. Frank's was an independent drum shop, and Frank's, but you t- that's a little bit later a on. A little later, so that kind of later on eventually. <laughs> later. But originally, the way these things were set up, starting probably in the 40s through the 50s and into the 60s, it started to change. But originally, these deals were set up where you were the dealer for that brand in that city, and that was your brand and your city. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's how it works. So I would go into a store, and if the, that store happened to be a Slingerland dealer, which the one where I took my lessons was, uh, I saw Slingerland drums. So I was probably, at this point, I was probably about maybe, let's see, 19, around 60. This was around 65, 66 ish. So I was born in 52. So was I 14 years old? Your first kid was a Ludwig. 
So. Uh, yeah, but I'm talking about when I first came aware of Slingerland. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, my first kit was a Ludwig, but that was only because um, I was I was young. I was 12 years old, and I just picked the cheapest thing we could find. And there was a dealer that had a a, a, a Ludwig, really really inexpensive club date type kit, and that's that's what I picked because it was inexpensive for my for my folks. But I used to take lessons at a music store, and I would see. Uh, Slingerland. And this was right around the time when they first introduced the satin flame finishes. And oh, if okay. I look in the catalog, I have to look. I know for sure it was by 1967, but it might have been around like 65, 66 when satin flames came in. And this particular music store, I remember, they had several sets set up. When I'd come in and walk down and go downstairs to take my lesson, and where they had the set set up, they had on top, they had a beautiful gold satin flame, which you could call yellow, but gold satin flame. Sure. And, you know, it's like a normal kit, which in those days was a rack tom, a floor tom, a bass drum, and a snare drum. And they had that. They also had the white satin flame, and they also had the blue, kind of like an aqua blue satin flame. And remember, those things, those finishes are really cool and different because before that was just normal sparkles or just things like... Uh, you know, the white marine pearls, yeah. the black diamond pearls. But I was also aware of Slingerland before that because Gene Krupa, <clears throat> who I'll get to in this whole litany of things, Gene Krupa was somebody I listened to on records because this is, you know, before I was listening to Buddy Rich and before I was listening to Louis Belson, and Krupa was a Slingerland artist for his entire career. Uh, his entire career he spent with, with Slingerland. So did you buy one of those kits when you first saw them? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, it's it's a weird thing. I did not buy a Slingerland kit uh, because as I was uh, learning more and developing more, I was listening more to, uh, at that point I started listening more to Buddy, Buddy Rich and, and Louis Belson. And at that time, uh, those guys, we're talking about now the mid, mid-60s, mid those guys were playing, uh, by the mid-60s, those guys were playing Slingerland but I hadn't bought one of those kits yet. I had a Ludwig kit from before, and eventually I did buy a Slingerland kit because Buddy played one, you know, Louis Belson was playing it, many other great players, and I love the set. So I think the first one I got was probably, oh, like sometime in the early 70s when I got my first Slingerland kit. Do you kit. remember what it was? Um, like the bill Well, and actually finish? I do remember, it was 73. It was 73 because I bought a copper over wood kit, which is still one of my favorite finishes in the whole world. Today. Yeah, yeah. We talked uh, about that one a lot, I think. Yeah, exactly. So I bought a copper over wood 13, 16, 22. Do you, do you remember, was it a three ply or a five ply? Oh, it was three ply then, because the yeah. five ply didn't come till 78. Cool. So I had that, and then I also um, bought a uh, chrome over uh, wood kit. I which, remember you telling me about these when I oh, was, yeah. I think I. When I was first starting drums, I was like, what's the biggest drum set you've ever had? And those, yep. those were that. Yep. Oh, and cool. the Chrome Over Wood kit was a fabulous <clears throat> kit. I gigged a lot with that. Um, Did till, you bring the whole thing usually? Or you know, I brought like most of it. Of it. <laughs> I, I had a, it was a, it was a uh, I, I've done a separate video of a kit that I bought recently that is basically the exact replica of what I had when I was young. It was <laughs> basically, uh, the kit I had was 13, 16, 18 floor, two 22-inch bass drums, uh, snare drum, and I had a uh, uh, 12 by 15 and 14 by 16 concert toms, just for fun. Just for fun. <laughs> and I used to take that. I actually had a, a, a jazz trio gig. It sounds like a big kit for a jazz trio uh, across the summer uh, with a vo- and a vocalist and at a, at a resort. And I was playing that kit. I, this is 1974, I think it was. Nice. I was playing that kit with only one of the bass drums because the rest wouldn't fit on the stage. Was that a like an organ trio? No, actually it wasn't. It was a standard uh, piano trio, piano bass, oh. uh, piano bass drums and a vocalist. <laughs> Did you do like a lot of outside stuff? Uh, no, this was all actually in a club, beautiful resort club in uh, uh, on Cape Cod. I was the scene you walk in with that thing, like, oh, jeez, what, uh, what I mean, are we you know, in for? I mean, Louis Belson, you plays double <laughs> bass kit with uh, w- with. Uh, you know, with with the trio, with the trio gig. Sure. So you know, it's it's fine. Once but they heard you play, I'm sure they knew you. It, they, it was they realized I could, you knew how to play the room. I could play. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, we, we should talk about um, yeah a little more on like the beginnings of the company. It's from Chicago, and and yeah, and then like we were talking about, they made this as an interesting story. It's in that book actually. They oh um, this book by the yeah, way, great book uh, Rob Cook, my great friend, and who. Uh, is the saint of all saints because he puts on the Chicago Drum Show every year. It has for every year, except 
during uh, 2020 when we had the COVID fiasco. But it looks like we're doing. It looks like we're going to have it this year. It'll be a little little different, probably. But uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be there. Hopeful. So yeah, if we'll, they do it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Rob made, did this book, the Slingerland book, and I, it's probably out of print. But if you want to try to find it, go to rebeats.com. R e b e a t s rebeats.com that's rob's website see if he's got any of these left this book is incredible it's got all kinds of information and it's a great knowledge source and just a fun book it's got all kinds of stuff in here you got pictures of drums you've got the history of the operation all the people who were significant to it including some of the people who managed it over the years some of the artists that played the stuff louis belson buddy rich you know ed shaughnessy bernard purdy at different times you know all kinds of great stuff so if you can get that book and yeah, the they they started in I, I think it was on Ashland maybe. Um, it was a it was a small like they was actually they were they were teaching stuff. They they were teaching like ukulele and and banjo. It was kind of a craze in the this would be like the twenties I think. And then they had like a business where they you would come for lessons and they'd give you an instrument and then you kind of pay it off through your lessons. Mm-hmm. So that's how they started from nothing. Mm-hmm. I, I always find it really interesting yeah. to see how these you know. Companies started from scratch. Ludwig's a little different. Ludwig, yeah. they, Ludwig started making drums. That yeah. was there, and they, if I remember correctly, Ludwig, totally different story. They started because they wanted to get a metal drum made, and that's why Ludwig's pretty much known for their metal drums. Slingerland, it's an interesting company because it, they made a little bit of everything. It wasn't just drums yeah. at any point. You can still yeah. see Slingerland banjos and yeah, you know, string instruments that so, are for I mean, sale. You know, Slingerland <laughs> was. Uh, in, you start talking about the twenties era. And that's when there was a lot of innovation beginning <clears throat> in, in drums. And you have to keep in mind, again, um, drum set drums were not the same in the 20s. We've talked about this a little in other uh, videos or other podcasts. In the 20s, a drum set was a bass drum, which was generally a 28-inch bass drum. It was a snare drum. There were no traditional toms. You'd have somebody with uh, cowbell, woodblock, temple blocks, uh, you know, Chinese tack bottom toms which is that that's what they were they were just like tack bottom goat skin or, or whatever they used tack bottom toms certainly not tunable and all these little miscellaneous accessories because basically they were traps playing kit. traps, traps kit because yeah. they were playing to support <clears throat> live performance acts or, or even in, movies in the theater yeah. in the movies <laughs> so they, they'd be in the pit orchestra and they have all these little crazy things like sound horse, effects horse hooves right. and horses <laughs> hooves you know whistles all kinds of crazy stuff maybe for like uh, dinner's ready or something. Yeah. <laughs> so there'd be all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. Like and it was not movie. a traditional set. In the homestead. But during that time, they started getting um, innovative. So, And this is Ludwig and Slingerland both. They started to do solid shells for their wood drums. Uh, they started to make the snare, wood snare drums. And they started to make the snare drums more professional and more involved. The strainers got better. Uh, the, the number of lugs increased. You know, they'd have uh, six lug drums, went to eight lug drums, and then also then to ten lug drums for better tuning. Uh, they also uh, got very innovative with their finishes. And this is both, both companies because it was a very competitive situation. Both Chicago-based, both major companies vying for market share with each other. And Leedy was in the mix too, but really it was Ludwig and Slingerland that were being the innovators going forward for drum set drumming. Uh, and then you start taking, let's take it a little bit further out of the 20s. Ludwig is known for the what we call the Black Beauty snare drum, except Ludwig never actually called their drum the Black Beauty. The Black Beauty was actually a drum produced by Slingerland in 1928-29, uh, only for a short period of time. But Slingerland made that Black Beauty drum in 28-29. That's what they called it. And they're some of the rarest... Uh, uh, drums available these days, and they're there's wonderful. A, there's maybe like twelve or thirteen in the uh, world. You know, it's about fourteen or fifteen at this point in and time. You had you had one at one point. I've had uh, three uh, over the course of time. I don't have any now. I but I've had three over the course of time, and they're great drums. But so you think about it, they started to become very innovative, and into the twenties, starting into the thirties, and then you get into the thirties, and you have uh, the fact that Gene Krupa was uh, becoming very, very famous. Uh, and you know, Gene had his own orchestra, but before that he was with Benny Goodman, and, and, and the list goes on and on. And he became very, very famous. And Gene was the person who prompted Slingerland into the idea of making 
tunable toms. So in some of the first tunable toms, basically had uh, tack bottom heads. Right, kind of like, like that. That's a Ludwig, but same yeah, idea. Yeah, same yeah. idea. It's got a tack bottom head, but it's got a wood hoop with T-rod handles so you could tune the top head. So it was probably Slingerland that did that before, and then probably Ludwig then copied, and everyone started yeah. copying. So, you know, Krupa was the inspiration for tunable <clears throat> toms, and, of course, then it went away from those T-rods, which is like tuning a timpani, a timpani T-rod, to a regular tension rod, and then also tunable bottom heads as well. Yeah. Uh, so that that's, you know, you're in the 30s again, so there's a lot of innovation there. And then, on top of it all, uh, Slingerland, right around 30, 1936, comes out with the Radio King snare drum, which is a very, very famous didn't, didn't woodshell snare drum. Didn't they have a different name for it right when it came out? It was called a broadcaster right, when but it that first was like came out. copyrighted or something. Yeah, yeah, very, very first came out. And those are super rare. If you find a Slingerland yep. broadcaster, very, very yep. rare. Yeah, so, um, so what you have there is uh, that, that Radio King snare drum, they're still highly prized uh, today, uh, solid maple shell and uh, brass double flange rims, a uh, what we call a three-point strainer because it attaches to the shell in three spots. Um, and basically, it was very, very, very warm-sounding drum, but very sensitive, yeah. and it was a masterpiece. It, so one that's thing a lot of stuff in the 30s. Gene Krupa, he had, uh, I think he had 20-inch floor toms, right? That, that like, uh, sing, sing, sing kind of... At one point, yeah, yeah. When he got to that point where <laughs> sing, sing, sing was the big thing, he had a uh, 20 by 20. So he had a yeah. 9 by 13, a 16, 16... Bass drum was usually a 22, but then his other floor time was a 20 by 20. It was just a big, enormous, monstrous thing. <laughs> and they were all, that's still in the era of calf heads. So those drums would be very, very warm sounding because calf has a very warm sound to it. Uh, yeah, check out, the, check out the old recordings. And then he's, he's so animated when he plays. It's, yeah. It's great. And, so, and, and he was a showman. He brought the drum set to the forefront of the orchestra. And uh, is and you can hear, I did a little thing about Krupa for an article I did for Modern Drummer and said, you know, Gene, uh, a lot of what you hear today in certain players uh, was influenced by, by Gene Krupa. If you listen to some of Ginger Baker's playing with Cream, there's an influence there with the use of the toms that, that tracks you back to Gene Krupa. So there are a lot of things that, uh, that we hear today and take for granted that actually go back to players from decades decades before generations before yeah and so so as it went on they, they had some early lug designs that were like really small lugs but then that cigar lug i love that design that's you know the one i'm talking yeah, about yeah the, the the lugs and we really didn't want to go too much deep into this stuff but they did change lug designs over the years and this what we're talking about is like a cigar lug but there's a certain particular shape to it it's called streamline too i think uh, it's another that name was for him. yeah later they, it's they like called a, it streamline the cigar is the really big one yeah later on they changed it, it almost to called like it a streamline sh- like a shell like a fish shell yeah and and a I'll lot of those up <laughs> a lot of those people. were um, they they they're, they're good looking but they were made kind of out of a pot metal Kind of a cheap. Yeah, metal. they crack sometimes. So they crack a lot. <clears throat> and they the, weren't. They weren't really. They're so pretty though. Those old like nickel plated ones. Yeah, a nickel hardware was was very common. And those. And <laughs> if if you're ever looking at old slinger on kits, you want to make sure they're they're like legit and stuff. <clears throat> These early kits, they're gonna have, um, like three ply. Um, it's either maple poplar maple or mahogany poplar mahogany. And then they have the ones that were made in the Chicago factory which would go on until they did eventually move out of chicago we went but, to niles in 60 yeah i don't know two something and you like can, that I you can look it tell up. the change because earlier than that um especially before they they have the new hoop which we'll talk about but they have these just like enormous reinforcement hoops on, oh on yeah the, the real so, early ones yeah, yeah if, you, if you have yeah, a it, was like, it was like a two inch yeah. wide reinforcement ring on the old on the old real beautiful drums. really round and we call it the radio king era that's what even yeah. the kits were called radio yeah kits the mahogany shells era, were, yeah. were great and those big re- you see the mahogany on the inside the big maple reinforcement rings there's some wonderful sounding drums from that era those are my favorite and i, I think that's in my, what do you think? I I think that's when they made the best quality drums when they were still in Chicago. Yeah, my I don't. I, well, I, see, I don't know because I have a particular fondness for the drums that came out of the '60s and the '70s. Sure, but that's just because I I played those drums, especially the ones made in the '70s. I am very fond of those, but I love the quality of the stuff made from basically the 40s onward. You know, if you had that Radio King coming in 1936, and then through the 40s. 
and through the 50s, they made great stuff. Krupa was still their primary uh, artist endorser. Uh, big band music was still the primary thing. So you had those shells. They had more of a rounded bearing edge. Uh, and they were, you know, mahogany shells and sometimes maple shells. And they had a warm sound. And they were more designed for middle to low tuning ranges and large size drums. Because you were playing in a big band, there was no... Uh, mics there were no mics you're playing live in an acoustic environment so you had to project so the bass drums would be starting around this time they start to get a little smaller because you could then have like a a 24 maybe bass drums with 24s and with 13 and 16 floors things like that i'm curious have you ever seen you know we're everyone's always looking for bop kits i've never seen one before maybe you have have you ever seen a chicago radio king era with the Streamline Lugs bop kit, because I don't think I've ever seen one before. Pre, pre-62? Yeah. You know, because um, it's there funny, cause you see from Gretsch the, ones. There's, you find some Three from plus. the 50s. Yeah. There have been a couple around. That would be amazing. Uh, I've never seen one of those. But <laughs> late 50s. So when they went to the, uh, the new version of the Streamline Lug, which is the lug that they used from that point yeah. through out, onward. That when yeah. everybody thinks Slingerland, that's the lug they think of, the modern lug. But I've seen a couple of kits. Um, With those big, like that old manufacturing style, the big the big reinforcement No, uh-uh, no, it's after that. They it's probably just that. didn't, like, offer it. Yeah, they, it's not yeah well, nobody wanted it. Nobody wa- An 18-inch bass drum made no sense to anybody. It would be useless right. for them <laughs> because of the type of music. So, uh, But you start looking at the product they made through the 40s and 50s was great. And the Radio King snare, at one point they change the snare strainer on the Radio King to something that those of us in the business called the clamshell, and they called it the super strainer. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's a horrendously bad design. I don't know why they did it. It's awful. And it makes some of those wonderful uh, solid maple shells sound all choked and boxy. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we just had a drum in the shop here. I uh, just sold it in about a day. A 6.5 by 14 Radio King from that era, and it had been stripped and refinished, and uh, the clamshell strainer was removed and three-point strainer was put on with the extension gates. And that's one of the best sounding drums yeah. that I ever, I did it on a video. The, the video will be out there. It's a video I did with that snare and a Ludwig, uh, 60 zero Ludwig double bass kit, two 13s, a 16, yeah. two 22s and white marine. The clamshell ones, they look cool, but they just don't work. They don't work. <laughs> and the strain is horrible. That, that's a funny thing about Slingerland. For, for whatever reason, they have more strainers, I think, than maybe every other drum company put together. I mean, there's so many, even the three-point ones, there's so many different variations of them. Yeah, there they were, were a always few different changes to them. I mean, they've got a bunch of a bunch of two-hole ones and then a bunch of three-hole ones. They've got the clamshell. They have yeah. I mean, just all kinds of yeah, different. Yeah, because there was, I forget the names, rapid strainer. I mean, the the, the general, you know, way snare strainers were, there was there were two holes and, you know, it's a simple, goes off, goes on, as a little knob to tighten it up. But then the three-point had been around since the, the 20s. Then they had the clamshell, and then you start going on and on. You right. had the TDR strainer, and they had this god-awful thing called a slap shot, which looked like about five pieces of metal bolted on each end of the drum, and it was like it had a this, handle that looked like a gear shift lever. It was yeah, crazy. This is just off the top of our heads. There are more. And uh, it, when someone calls me and they have a Slingerland and they're asking strainer questions, I'm just like, oh, man, I'm probably well, not going to be able to answer this. Zoomatic, Zoomatic strainer. Right. So, yeah. See, there's so, so many there's, of them. There's, yeah, there's, there's a ton of them. We should, but, we should talk about... Uh, another interesting kind of failed innovation, the tone flange. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And this goes and actually, back to the whole history of the company. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that. I'm glad you did. Uh, <laughs> there, was a, there was a thing that they did uh, on a snare drum. They called it a tone flange. And what it was was they took basically, okay, a banjo has this, like, soundboard, this, this metal piece, yeah. okay? And they decided to take that metal piece, the same size as the head, and put it on a snare drum. But it doesn't just fit on over the he- over the shell like a head. There's these little posts that it goes on to. Yeah, it's got like metal screws. Yeah. So you can't you can't use one of those drums without it. You That's right. Yeah. It. You have to have it. So a metal uh, metal piece. And it, but it, it does the sound is interesting. It does give the drum a different sound. Very dry. It's very, very dry. Very dry. Uh, most people hate them, but yeah. and it's some you know it's like a, it's this metallic <laughs> thing. The shell is wood, but then this this tone ring is metallic, so yeah. <clears throat> it's a little weird. Um, Super cool, though. Like, 
<laughs> but that but that was something that they made. They called it the tone flange, and it was on their drums in the in the twenties, and then it was it was gone. But those are rare drums and fairly collectible. My good friend Mike Corrado uh, used yeah, to that. specialize in those, and he made he had someone make a, a a replica of the tone flange because when he collected those drums, they almost always the flan the tone flange was gone. Right. So he found a way to have somebody make some so that he could put them on the collector drums or sell them to people who, who wanted one. Really, really esoteric little. Yeah, yeah it was kind of kind of crazy. Remember remember when we got that? We got one in here when I first started working here. It was like a green sparkle one. And I, I, yeah. I always thought that drum was really cool. They yeah. they sound so dry, though. And yeah, <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, the other thing is you, you can't put a normal head on it. That's the other really frustrating part with those. Because the calf head is like a little bit bigger. Yeah, it was it, so. And Remo made yeah, a strange heads. Strange animal. Yeah, Remo made heads that you could you could. I think they had like custom ones, so maybe yeah. you can still get. Because Remo, Remo to would do, do stuff. Remo would make the international <laughs> heads or the you know the pre-international heads. The the metric. <laughs> if you get a premier kit from back in whenever, they'll make the metric heads and they'll do all that stuff. And but then, anyway, uh, one last thing. Uh, we should talk about some of the finishes that the that the drums had. Yeah, yeah that's they, a good point. Yeah, they, they have. Slingerland is another thing. Tons of strainers, tons of finishes, like yeah. all kinds of finishes you wouldn't believe. In each era, we should talk about the ones that I think were special. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> in the twenties, there was a big thing for. Uh, if you if you can see some of the ads in the twenties, it w- it was really funny because they would talk about uh, the the finish. If your drum has extra flash, <laughs> your earning potential will go up. So, you know, you don't want to have this this dull-looking drum set. You want to have this flashy-looking drum set. And if you do, the band leader will pay you more money. Well, it's not quite that simple. Yeah, but the ads are just, just a... Just yeah, the ads so, are so, hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but they did make some really great finishes. And there's some stuff in, in the Slingerland book. Uh, my, my friend Mike Corrado specializes in collecting some of the older finishes. But like emerald, were, emerald pearl. Oh, there were many things, and you're not going to be able to see it in here. But I'll look. I'll use this as reference. I can take some pictures and put them you up. You know, yeah. there is one of this is one of the uh, the true bl- uh, black beauty style drums right there. Black beauty. This is like a rose pearl. Yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, I mean, it's just stunning. They had they some are, abalone stuff too. Oh yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. There's uh, there's a sea green. It's in here too. It's like a green marine pearl. And there were guy, finishes called. Um, guy that comes to the drum show every. He used to actually. He would have like twenty of the emerald. Mark Slingerland. Mark yeah. Cooper. He, yeah. He yeah. loves that color. There were also colors that were. <laughs> it's hard to describe, but peacock sparkle, where they were. That's cool. Um, like uh, like a swimming sea of a multiple of different colors all like folded together yeah. and th- they was it was beautiful stuff they got but, someone's got to remake that finish legit uh, it, it would be costly they made then, ones that are similar but they never look yeah. but then also of course you know <laughs> then they had some of the regular finishes but they were very innovative with finishes because you start getting into like i said the um the 60s of course they had satin flame finishes they had that there's more cool ones there. And, you know, they had rare. Mardi Gras finishes, which of which we make a, a, an example of Mardi Gras today yeah. uh, that we use with, with Gretsch. Uh, they made Mardi Gras. They had Fiesta Pearl. They had uh, uh, something. The veils. Uh, the oh, gold veils, gold silver veil. Silver veil. All these crazy finishes. And the, the, a lot of the other companies, like Gretchen, Gretchen and Ludwig, they had a much more limited selection of finishes. You see weird ones that are uncatalogued, but I think Slingerland... Yeah. They did. The Slingerland <laughs> had a, a, a really uh, wide variety going there. And you know, Ludwig was a little bit more, you know, you got all the sparkles, and you had white marine pearl, black diamond pearl, and, you know, they had different things at different times. But Slingerland really had a lot of different finishes. And then they went on to, as as things got you further, you get into the, the, the 60s, of course, you had satin flames, you start to get into the 70s. Aztec. Oh, uh, oh the, 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 I like that one. I, I don't know. I don't think. Oh, then marble too. Marble. They had another marble, one. silver veil. Uh, they had a finish that they called. I got. I got to find it here. The, find the name for it. But it's, it's crazy. They had white Aztec was one. Yellow Aztec, green Aztec, and then they did one that was. They called it like a Cordoba, which was like <laughs> fake leather. And I used to like it was like the, the the Cordova car. It was Cordova leather. We used to like it's like the ads with the. Uh, for the for the car with the Corinthian leather that uh, Ricardo <laughs> Montalban used to, it was a Dodge or something it was craziness <laughs> and then of course in the seventies they also had the uh, uh, the finishes that were that I talked about the copper that was actual real metal 
over wood. The copper and the and the, the chrome over wood finishes. They had all of that stuff. So and then they had a whole host of uh, really really beautiful finishes that were like oil finishes, like a teak wood oil, uh, just oak wood lacquer, cherry wood lacquer, rosewood. They they just went crazy with the stuff. And there's some just gorgeous finishes over the years. So they were really innovative with the stuff. Second stuff, it's just fun because because you have yeah. the, all those different. And there, yeah, if anyone listening out there has like a 2012, 16, 2012, 14 in the Aztec finishes, let me know about it because I'll buy it from you. I, I like that finish. Oh, it's crazy. My dad thinks it's kind of ugly, but I think it's cool. It's, it's just it's They're just, all 22s, though. You never see one yeah, of those it, in it a mostly, yeah. 20 or an 18. It's, but but they were, that, that's absolutely true. The Slingerland finishes were, were just fantastic and crazy. So you start thinking, you know, the 50s, uh, you still had Krupa in the mix. Uh, into the 60s and 70s is when you started to get uh, Buddy Rich was playing Slingerland from around like 66-ish. Louis Belson was playing Slingerland as well. Um, <clears throat> Louis Belson, then uh, he stayed with Slingerland, uh, it moved around, but he was with Slingerland in the, uh, the period when they started doing more innovative things. Like there was uh, the TDR strainer uh, was one that uh, he helped in development of, which is a, actually a great snare strainer. And uh, he also was involved in the design for the two-in-one snare, which we've got somewhere. It's yeah, it's yet another. Yeah. They, they have so many different kinds 12 of snares. And that's not a new design. That goes way back to, the, to some of the boutique companies, and I'm not going to remember like the right Wolf? one. It, might have, it, uh, it was Wolf. I think yeah. it was Wolf. It wasn't Duplex. It was Wolf. Wolf, yeah. Had I that design. That yeah. 12 lugs on top, six on the bottom. I saw one of those at the drum show, and I, I yeah. found it to be memorable. <laughs> and, and, and then I they got this one, too. This several. is like a... Kind of a copy of the Super Sense. Yeah, what that was. This? It was the. Uh, I can't remember. Right Super now. Sound King. Or uh, something? Super Sound King. But this was, yeah, this was the Slingerland version of of the Ludwig Super Sensitive Strainer. We repaired uh, this one. It's not quite original, but it yeah. does work. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a good strainer. But they had a lot of innovation going on, and this is taking it on in you know the '60s through the '70s, and the people who managed the business through the '60s and '70s, um, good people. You know, there were good people involved. Um, there running that business and uh, this is after Bud Slingerland but it was a it was a good uh, operation and then you know just like uh, with Ludwig Ludwig and Slingerland both became started to become victims of uh, competition from uh, imports and in the 60s there really the competition from imports wasn't very good because the imported product was basically junk at that point in time it was really poor quality low end just bare bones student product, uh, you know, six lug bass drums, uh, six lug snare drums, shells that were so light they felt like balsa wood. They just they weren't good drums, but things started to change, uh, started changing in the uh, 70s for sure, and uh, that started to eat into market share for the Ludwig's and the Slingerlands of the world, and by the 80s, I'll say by the early 80s things were starting to uh, appear that they weren't going to be right. as they were before. And and those companies, they and then things started to change hands. You know, Ludwig was sold uh, at, at one point. But before we get into the more, like, modern uh, era, uh, I wanted to just touch on a couple. Like, I always think these old companies are really just so much more interesting than a lot of the modern ones because they all had something that kind of was uniquely there sound-wise. Mm -hmm. And one... We've talked about the many different things that they did, but the stick saver hoop is oh, yeah. that is their invention. Yeah. People still use it. Um, the, yeah. And especially, you'll see different types of stick savers, uh, mostly chrome. Sometimes you get some nickel ones. But the earlier ones in the beginning 60s, like right when they moved from the Chicago factory to the Niles uh, factory, are, are chrome over brass. Yeah. And those, he, Peter Erskine Agreed. likes those. I know because he his Thomas snare drum has their like, raw their brass. Their version of, yeah, raw yeah. brass version. <laughs> But you're right about that. Um, and you think about stick saver, you have to explain a couple things. Um, in the 40s, a lot of the rims, 30s and 40s, a lot of the, the rim that was on the drum was a straight edge. Very sharp. Yeah. Sharp edge. And they used to call them stick choppers because, yeah. they, you know, it was kind of a, not sharp like a knife, but it was thin and it would if you <laughs> played on it a lot it would start to eat up the, your sticks those are actually my favorite but you go through yeah. sticks like you wouldn't believe if you're doing rim yeah. shots <laughs> and now they make rims like that but they uh, they make them a little thicker it's like the 302s from yeah. Gretsch Gretsch yeah. makes one and there's others you can buy uh, but they're a little thicker so it doesn't damage the sticks but you had that then later on 
companies started to go with uh, that what they call that was like a double flange, meaning there was a flange here around the ear, another flange here, and then it came straight yeah. up. They had a triple flange where the third flange was at the top. Most companies had that flange outward. So now that created an area where you could do a rim shot and right. it was thicker because they flanged it outward and it was therefore that was, not eating up your sticks. That was the WFL Ludwig solution to the, right. Because people, to keep in mind with those thin hoops, back then people were playing a lot quieter. Yeah. People get the louder they get, more amplification, yeah. then you're really going to start going So Slingerland started their <clears throat> version of a triple flange is, in my opinion, more attractive and I think actually easier to play. They took that top, instead of on the top of the edge of the rim, instead of flanging it out away from the shell, they flanged it over toward the head. So I think the profile of that yeah. is better. It is, in my estimation, easier to do a rim shot with it. Um, <laughs> And it, I think it looks good. Yeah, they, I think they give the the drum kind of like a little bit of a round, fat sound, which I love. I love like the '60s Slingerland drums. They they're you know they're all like little imperfections in how they're made. Sometimes the bearing edges probably aren't quite totally flat, but the combination of of just those little imperfections and those round hoops give you just a really nice, tasty sound that you don't have to muffle too much. And that, yeah. that's one of the things I love yeah. about those those drums. You, Modern drums that can be a little ringy, but those old Slingerland stuff from the '60s and '70s, yeah, uh, they yeah they don't they don't ring until next week. <laughs> they, yeah, it, the sounds I mean, there and gone. The drums know. the drums sound great. So, uh, but so anyway, we, I'll I'll kind of work toward a little bit of a wrap up here. So, you, we were talking about you get into the '80s and you've got competition coming in from uh, from import products that were actually becoming very 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 good. You know, you start talking about import products coming into this country in the 80s, and there was really good stuff being made. So put pressure on the domestic companies, and things changed hands. Companies changed hands over the course of time. We, we have to say one of the lowest points for Slingerland was they actually experimented with cardboard shells at one point. Maybe we shouldn't even talk about that. but <laughs> there, there, there was a sad moment. When the shells were actually cardboard, yes, that's and, just, and they, I think, if they got wet, they would just fall it apart. It was just, it was just. Not, and if, if you have good. one of those, though, they're, they'd probably be kind of collectible because there's probably like none left. Not by me, uh, <laughs> or not by anybody I know, but but th that was uh, kind of a novelty yeah. item. <laughs> but you know, and and again, um, in in one respect, you have to cut people some slack because everybody is saying, well, let's try different things to figure out what. Uh, what could possibly work? You know, what could work? What do we need to do? How can we create a product that can compete? And think about it. Some of this was before. Nowadays, modern drum companies, when they want to target their low-cost lines, those lines are all made overseas. But if you think about the era here that we're talking about, drum companies were not having products made overseas. Hardware was not made overseas. Drum heads were not made overseas. Everything that these drum companies had was made right here in the U.S. Some of these companies made their own hardware or they jobbed it out to hardware manufacturers in this country. Yeah, like Leedy used to do their own chrome plating, I think, yeah. back in the way so, long ago. So, you know, you have all of those things going on. Uh, companies were making their own shells in, the, in certain cases. In Gretsch's case, Jasper was making the shells. Uh, but the bottom line is... It was not the same world. So if people were saying, well, we as a U.S. company have to figure out some kind of product to compete with what's coming in from Japan or wherever it was, well, what are we going to do? So they start working on ideas. So yeah. you have to cut them a little slack for the cardboard shells. Uh, you know, they, I were, mean, they were just trying to lower cost, I, yeah, I think. And, yeah. and I mean, oh. some of it, well, some of it we should talk about. Yeah. Some of the things that were designed to lower cost were things like uh, kits that were then made with a center lug design. Yeah. So you had one lug, Ludwig called them Club Date, uh, Slingerland called them Stage Band, Gretsch called them Playboy Series, but they had one center lug on every drum instead of two rows of lugs. It was less hardware, a little less expensive, and ma actually made the drums lighter. They were the same shells as the other drums, so they actually sound great. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it was a cost savings to help compete. The snare drums, on there. <laughs> right? And those snare drums they would issue with those kits would be six lug drums instead of eight lug drums. Yeah, you see, you a know, lot of they would and use, some people love those. I know a guy 
who has like a hundred of those. His entire collection is all six lug Slingerland drum yeah, in all fine. of those rare finishes we were talking yeah, about. They sound fine. We, we should touch on Slinger Leedy as well because at one point... Oh, yeah. We, they, we can a little bit. Yeah, we should. Because mm-hmm. at one point, the there's a long backstory to uh, the whole situation with uh, Leedy uh, because Leedy was a company that ended up being owned by uh, Khan, Khan yeah. and at the same time that they also owned Ludwig. So there was this period of time when Leedy and Ludwig were under the same banner but were not operated by William F. Ludwig or any Leedy at all. Uh, and that was owned by C.G. Khan. You'll see that badge on drums. They're nice right. drums, too. They're, they're the Leedy really and Ludwig idea. drums <laughs> were, were good drums, but bottom line, then these things got sold off and the Leedy name basically uh i think it was 19 around 58 ludwig bought back his name uh from Khan, and then uh Leedy was sold off to slingerland right so Leedy, and that was a, there was a blue badge Leedy, uh and the lug design was the same as the Leedy lug design was but then from that point they're basically forward, slingerlands though they're, it's they're basically made, they're just yeah, slingerland rounded drums. bearing ads they don't have those yeah. old Leedy kind of it was it was a Slingerland <clears throat> set with Leedy lugs on it, uh, even Slingerland floor tom leg brackets. I mean, it was a Slingerland set, but it had yeah. Leedy lugs and a Leedy badge on it. And, yeah, and it was relegated down to a a second line, a budget line. It was never really given much uh, marketing support, and I think it was around. Didn't didn't Shelly Mann play those? I think yeah, he did. Shelly Mann played Leedy drums. Yeah, I'm, all the way yeah. through. He's one of the well, I, I not really all the like way through. Drums. I mean, he then he went. He was playing Pearl. Later on oh. in the seventies, maybe everyone had to give it. But to the <laughs> then eventually, the Leedy <laughs> thing was just totally discontinued, yeah. and that got sold uh, off. Uh, again, things got sold all over the place. Slingerland was sold at one point. Slingerland was owned by Gretsch, and then it got sold off to Gibson. And Fred Gretsch retained the rights to Leedy, and still retains the rights to Leedy today. And also, though, uh, for a, a oh, we're, we're yeah, we're talking about Leedy then. Yeah, back to Slingerland. We should talk about what happened with because um, uh, there were there were some that were made uh, single ply snare drums mostly. What was that city? What city were they made in? Was it Nashville? Oh, well, Slingerland, Nashville. That's yeah. kind of that's that's sort of the. You're, you're going a step further now. Uh, right, right. Slingerland. Yeah, sorry to start no, ahead okay. of the game there. It's okay. It's <laughs> okay. I mean, Slingerland, when you uh, – the sale I just talked about here, there were a bunch of things that, <clears throat> that took place. And then Slingerland was uh, owned by Gibson and – So that was before the Nashville thing. Yeah, but well, Slingerland was owned by Gibson, and there were many of what I'll call fits and starts – on the Slingerland side, I think at one point they were running through general managers every uh, 120 days. <laughs> and they but, were really the drums but, that came out were really not very good. No, not not that's not quite true. the The concept behind it was okay, but there was not a lot of continuity and a lot of thought or or planning behind the whole thing. So, I guess I, I look at it this way: there was a period of time when uh, under Gibson ownership, Slingerland did flourish, and that was when two people uh, were involved. And one was Pat Foley, okay, who was a great this. guy in uh, design and also great with with work on on finishes on shells. And Niles Factory is closed by this no, point. this is this, we're way yeah. way past we're way yeah. past that. And then uh, my good friend and now our president, uh, our, our exec VP of Craviato, Sam Baco. Sam Baco was involved during the Pat Foley era with Slingerland, and <laughs> Sam is the one who created uh, the incredible Studio King drums from that era of the 90s. Those Studio King drums were incredible instruments. The shells were fantastically made. Uh, the finishes were great. So do you know where and those shells were made? Nashville. Everything was done yeah. in Nashville. And those, those drums were made beautifully, and they were fantastic instruments. The, the trouble with that was that, um, I think as, as the, the trouble with that was that the drums were priced incorrectly. They were priced uh, so high that uh, no one would purchase the drums. For example, I think at the time, probably the most expensive kit at that time was probably a sonar kit a high-end sonar kit. 
And that high-end sonar kit at the time, maybe for a four-piece or five-piece kit, was maybe like $4,000. We're talking like 1990? In the 90s. No, this is like probably, I have to look it up. I think it's 95, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah, but, you go to the go to the uh, drum pad back then, you see sonars everywhere. Sonar was probably <clears throat> the most expensive kit at that point in time. And it was probably four grand for a kit. They wanted 5000 for the same Slingerland kit. And that's what was the issue because... Despite the fact that they sounded incredible and they looked great, <clears throat> it was just a price point that was hard for people to, to absorb. Right. So um, those are probably maple shells at that point, like all maple. I think it's a it's a great shell. Sam was responsible for that that shell composition. He devised it. He created it, and they were incredible drums. Even today, when those drums come up for sale in the marketplace, they go very quickly. They yeah. were really well made. Not too many. So <laughs> you know, you look at all these things, and but you know that also came and went uh, for management reasons. And at the end of the day, uh, Slingerland kind of went through some other fits and starts and then eventually became fairly dormant. At one point, uh, when it was dormant around 2008, I actually inquired about uh, purchasing it. But at that time, uh, it wasn't for sale. Uh, They would license it, but they wouldn't sell it at that point in time. It was still owned by Gibson. So that's fine. That was, you know, that's, that's their right to do. Uh, but long story short, eventually it moves us up to today. And today, or actually last year, is, is a great thing because uh, uh, my, my good friend uh, Chris Lombardi over at DW uh, worked on a deal to purchase uh, the Slingerland Company from Gibson. Gibson uh, changed management and, uh, recently and was looking to streamline things and realized that they really didn't need to be in the drum business uh, since it had been dormant for them for so long. So Chris Lombardi worked out something where uh, it actually became a, a gift for his dad, Don, I think for Don's 75th birthday, uh, that they purchased uh, Slingerland from, from Gibson. So uh, what I'm, I'm excited about that because I, uh, I know that Don Lombardi appreciates, and so does Chris and John Good. They appreciate uh, the fine quality of what Slingerland was for decades, uh, and they are committed to bringing that back to the market and to the Slingerland name. So I think it's a wonderful thing. It can come full circle to uh, the ownership under under Drum Workshop, and I think it'll be a wonderful, wonderful product. I, I told them when they did it, I said, when, when Chris announced it, I called him and I said, okay, that's you got it. Then I'll, I got an order in right now for the first 10 Radio Kings and the first 10 drum sets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so more, I'm really excited about that. And more of course, to come on that. Then, of course, <clears throat> COVID uh, kind of put a lot of things. That was in 2019. And, of course, COVID uh, in 2020 put a lot of things on hold. So, But maybe maybe for the next, like next year's, maybe 2022's NAMM show, then maybe we'll have something... Yeah, I, I uh, yeah. yeah, we have to, uh, you know, I loop back with them and see see where things are and talk to them about some things. But I'm excited about it, and I think that will be uh, a fitting way for uh, that name to come back to the market and be done in the right way, as opposed to, uh, you know, let's try to resurrect a, a former great legacy brand, and we do... Yeah, they're they're the perfect guys. Bad, to you know, you don't want some. You don't want to try to do that. Do a bad job and make it worse instead of better. And Don and Chris and John will do it absolutely the right way. And I will be thrilled to support it through the shops. I remember those those shells that they were making. Uh, DW was making them. They were like, what did they call them? It was just the Jazz series, I think, right? And it was uh, they had reinf- big reinforcement hoops. I think uh, there was not some the Jazz series. There, there was. Um, there was a special series that they did. It's a lot like those. It was very, shows. very. It was designed off of uh, a a a forty zero Radio King yeah. <laughs> uh, kit. Those are great. Yeah, and what, you know, one of the kits with the big wide reinforcement rings, and those those shells actually did have those wide reinforcement rings. Yeah. And they sounded terrific. They have a, a version of that shell now uh, that they uh, that they do, and those drums sound great. They're different than the traditional uh, DW shell compositions. There's so much cool stuff they could do. I wonder, like, which lug are they going to choose to use? They'll probably use, like, the 60s one. It'll be interesting to see. But, you know, we have to uh, just let things unfold properly, and they will. And they'll, uh, you know, Don and Chris and John will do it the right way, and they'll take their time doing it the right way so that whatever comes to market will be uh, top quality and no one will be disappointed. You can resurrect some of those old old finishes. (laughs) 
if you get like never an Aztec, uh, Aztec <laughs> probably not the or, Aztec, <laughs> but maybe, you never know. Yeah, maybe one of the, one of the veils or you know, some, yeah. one of the cool ones. <laughs> there's, there's some great stuff out there. So and and plus, you can do those things today much more uh, efficiently than you could then. The technology now is. I mean, when we did the Mardi Gras wrap to recreate the Mardi Gras wrap, and Gretsch did that for me. Uh, trying to do something like that, it was so simple uh, now versus how it was before. The technology now is 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 amazing yeah. compared to what it was. Mardi Gras finish first made its debut like in the fifties. Well, there was no digital technology. There's no digital anything in the fifties. Everything was very isn't that, very. Isn't that actual confetti? They just sprinkled that. Yeah, I mean it's actually very very Each labor drum intensive. Is different. Yeah, you got. There'll be a slight <laughs> slight variance. More dense on some. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's pretty remarkable. So. That, I think, kind of yeah. takes Slingerland from uh, the early 1900s up to the present day. That's a long trip. Yeah, a lot. I think we covered just about everything. And then uh, this is, I think, number four of drum companies. We're going to yeah. do other companies. Eventually, we'll do... Yeah, we got a little um, off the track. We were trying to do... Uh, yeah, we just got so much Do them more on. frequently. But I think we've still got to do Gretsch. I think we did Ludwig. We did... I did Fives. We did Rogers. You're right, yeah. Yeah, so we got to do Gretchen, we got to do Camco. Yeah, we got to do Camco. And then at some point we might do one that maybe focuses on all of the smaller companies. You yeah, know? It might, some of the, there's some like cool, like weird little cool funky things out there. Zicko's, North Drums, Capella. I mean, there's right. a whole, and there's some great, uh, uh, in, uh, call them import from like Osba, the early Osba stuff. Uh, from France, there's fabulous stuff there. Premier, Premier in the 60s, that stuff was phenomenally good chrome plating from the the people that played it for rolls royce i mean there's a whole bunch of things we can kind of dial in there that were lesser known brands yeah we should do we should do one that's just european so maybe yeah. like like you know like osba premier, premier osba, and sonar sonar yeah so i mean sonar's history is, is huge. two hours Trixon. out of that <laughs> Trixon too oh yeah can't or that Trixon <laughs> slash vox but basically Trixon. yeah sure. we can get a lot of mileage out of, out of those it's crazy stuff yeah sounds yeah. good yeah thanks for listening everybody thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs>